So we'll start with Sandeep Sangaru, who's the founder and director of Sangaru Design Studio. And I'd allow Sandeep to introduce himself and some of his work for us. Good morning. I'm a wanderer and I tend to get lost in my imagination. All I ever wanted to do was travel, explore, and experience different ways of life. When I came across uh, Crafts Practice of India through a couple of assignments, I decided then to explore this area. This practice, which employs millions of artisans across the country, I was pulled into it, as it allowed me to experience different ways of life. And so much can be done working with craftsmen, working with traditional materials, with simple tools and techniques, which had evolved over many generations of refining. And they are sustainable. The challenge was it's a decentralized sector and a way of life for people practicing it. It is undervalued as the younger generation of practitioners are not looking at the craft as a valuable proposition. They see what seems like better opportunities doing something else elsewhere. It is justified as they see it. But for me, it was a personal journey to travel and explore design, to produce to market and bring these products uh, to an audience that can appreciate craft in a new way. So this was happening since the last 15 years. And out of those, I lived out of a bag for eight years, traveling across the country, documenting different crafts and working with artisans. My belief was to apply design thinking in some way that could bring back the dignity to the practices of these traditional materials and tools. It was not easy in the beginning to convince craftsmen to experiment and explore new ways as they saw it as a futile exercise coming from a stranger like me. But my persistence to create and gave me a reason to explore. I worked with Bamboo in Northeast and it so happened our work got recognized uh, globally and won many accolades and auctioned at Christie's Contemporary Art and Design at Shanghai in London last year. So it was a journey from a village to an auction house uh, trying to explore our traditional crafts. And along with that, I've been working in areas uh, in Kashmir with walnut wood carving and turnwood uh, uh, lacquer craft from Chinnapatna. I hope uh, we will be able to sustain these new ways to relook at the past for a new future and rethink and bring a change in the way we see crafts and the lives of these craftsmen. At the end of the, these, the products are just a manifestation of these experiences of working with hands to create something meaningful to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Could I request Rakesh to kindly introduce yourself, please? Rakesh is a project lead for Better Air at IKEA. Namaste to all of you and a very good morning. A brief introduction about me, I am a supply chain professional working with the industries, various industries I have worked with for the past 25 plus years. And during my current stint with IKEA, I got an opportunity to work uh, for the many people. And it all started with uh, the blue color that uh, we wished in Delhi to see. Uh, it is all about the sky that we never see in Delhi because of the air pollution. And so this work, this project, it all started with uh, the problem that we were facing in Delhi, especially in the winters, wherein, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of air pollution uh, happening primarily, I would say, because of the crop burning. Yes, there are, uh, you know, uh, data in the public domain which says that other sources of pollution are, you know, uh, it is vehicular emissions, it is the industry, it is the dust drums. Uh, but the northern India faces this problem mainly because of 
crop burning, especially in winters, because uh, it gets heavier and then everything settles down and then we are not able to breathe properly. So a lot and a lot more people are suffering. And that's how, uh, you know, we at IKEA decided that we should do something about it, uh, however small it may be, but then we have to make the beginning. And that's how we started. Uh, so we thought that, yes, uh, we'll convert this uh, waste, which is rice straw, into some meaningful resources. And that's how we began the journey. It started with, uh, you know, the agricultural plant-based raw material risk assessment, wherein we analyzed, uh, you know, the farm situation. Uh, we met with the collectors of the crop residue. Also, uh, if we see this, that uh, uh, there were many areas with respect to the water part of it. So uh, when I take uh, one by one the respons responsible sourcing principles, it is like water security, biodiversity, food security, land rights and conversions. Basically, it is all about the practices in the region that uh, were to be analyzed from the risk point of view. And uh, yes, there were uh, some low and medium type of risk which can be mitigated and then it could be taken to a very different level, how we can handle this. There is no established supply chain for this as of now, and we wish to create that. That's how we began, and we did the, uh, you know, uh, followed these principles to uh, secure all the things before we proceeded. Yes, uh, the initial thought was that, yes, this raw material, uh, which is rice straw, it is technically possible to, uh, you know, uh, to produce pulp out of it, either mechanically or chemically. That's how we used it, and uh, we used the cellulosic material into this to make the pulp. And then, uh, you know, this is the small process that we ha I'm trying to showcase over here, that uh, after the raw material, it is, uh, you know, we have to shred it, and after the shredding, it has to go to the digesters, and then pulp making is done, and then followed with, uh, you know, the paper. That's how we followed the process in this area, and there was another thing that uh, we wanted to do in this uh, was, it was the rugs that we tried to make out of the rice straw. And yes, uh, we, we thought that yes, it could be uh, woven into uh, a rug along with the cotton yarns. So that's what we did. And then to prevent the molding and other stuff, we used the, you know, permitted uh, lacquering of the stuff. Yes, our aim is, uh, you know, we, we wish to create this uh, scenario wherein we can convert the entire waste into uh, a meaningful resource and that is not possible with uh, you know one organization or one project doing it it has to be a collaborative approach wherein you know uh, this is just the beginning and we think that yes there is many more things to come onto it finally we were able to uh, you know uh, select 16 articles that you see on the left hand side uh, that we will be launching test marketing into five different countries and uh, we have named the range as forandering, which in Swedish means the change. And this is the change that we wish to bring about and create uh, you know, a better everyday life for the many people. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Um, next, we have Henry Skupnovich, co-head of the Godrej Design Lab. Hi, everybody. I'm Henry Skupnovich. I've lived and worked in India since 2013, um, and I'm currently one of the heads of uh, GDL or Godrej Design Lab. Um, so my background is in computational design from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, kind of uh, that area brought me to India years ago to set up the Fab Lab. Um, I'm pretty interested in, personally interested in, in how code affects um, us as designers, not only as a skill, but as a way for us to very rigorous, rigorously define the role of the designer. Um, computers are not that bright. They force us to be very exact about everything. Um, and so it really is an interesting way to look at the design process. Um, and then, of course, taking code out of the computer and uh, physically instantiating it um, and getting some very interesting material effects. This is my background. Um, now, I'm currently one of the heads of Gordridge Design Lab, and, and for most of you probably know that Godridge, for the last 120 years, has been, uh, has defined itself about 
making a modern India through the process of designing and making things. So whether that is locks, rocket engines, appliances, what have you. Um, and it's, this idea of national progress is really important to the company. So Godrich Design Lab pushes this idea forward, and so we're striving to empower the larger design ecosystem. Uh, the design ecosystem in India has a great uh, opportunity as well as a responsibility to shape, to, to actually decide and shape the future um, of India. Um, since 2014, we've had the pleasure of working with almost 40 different designers on a various uh, different projects, usually short-term design projects. Um, and in the, about the last year and a half, we've kind of radically changed how we work. Um, there are a few names below that we've had to kind of redact because we're just about to, to release uh, some, some new um, uh, inductees in our new fellowship program. And so the GDL fellowship program is really an opportunity for young independent designers to receive mentorship as well as a supportive safety net um, for them to tell their story of how they see um, what, does, what does a future designed uh, contemporary India look like, right? Um, and one thing in our, in our own personal journey is kind of a transition um, to this, where we're moving away from kind of a typical design competition uh, format to more of a fellowship supportive one. Um, so over the course of about three months, we work with designers on a small scale design project, really again to um, act as a way to capture as well as to share a larger kind of narrative about what does it, de what does it mean to design in India today. So these are some images that we just, that are just about to be released from um, kind of the first fellowship of its type with Studio Pomegranate, and they're a Mumbai-based um, design firm, and they've worked on everything from uh, municipal corporation projects to, uh, you know, flagship stores for high-end fashion. And so we worked on a, on a small uh, family of tables that was trying to be as light as possible, um, and so using combinations of looking really closely at material as well as process in order to attain something um, within, you know, which, which I think is actually quite fetching. Um, so I wanted to wrap up today, and here's the final. Um, this is about, each one is about two kgs, less than two kgs. Um, so I'm often asked, what type of design are we or I am interested in? Um, and I find that a kind of a difficult question to ask, because as a designer, I think you should be interested in just about everything. Um, I think a better question is, what type of design do we need? Right, and this is very important in the, in the context of material, as materials are becoming more and more valuable. Um, and so a lot of people have tried to answer this question or have answered it, them in their own way in time, whether it's the Eameses with the idea of the Lota here in India, Morrison with his supernormal objects, or uh, Yanagi with his folk craft. Um, and I've racked my brain for what is the right word. And the best that I can come up with is just real. I want design to feel real. Um, and I think that this is also very important at this moment in time in India where we as design practitioners have to redefine what design is and fit it into um, everyday life. Um, and so this is how I kind of break down what does, how do I define what real design is? I'm a lover of words. If anybody here has suggestions, I would love to tweak and edit exactly what these words are. Um, but first off, real design has to be accessible. So somebody has to be able to imagine it, maybe not in their house today, but tomorrow. There's also this idea of desirability. Um, and we should try for at least a period of time to forget this word luxury, um, maybe just as an academic exercise. Um, these first two really are kind of how we view design and the consumer. Um, but as designers, we have to remember these second two. First off, we have to think about our design. Not only do we have to get it out into the real world, but our designs will have a profound effect on our environment and especially our culture um, and societies for a long periods of time ahead. So while we have to think, we also have to not think too hard.
right? Um, and this is kind of another way of saying, can we stop being clever? <laughs> a lot of design is a little too clever. And what we forget is that at the end of the day, design and objects are about use, not functions, right? If we look at um, a lot of stuff in tech or in furniture or stuff like that, there's a race to pack as many features into our objects. And what we forget is that at the end of the day, people have to use our objects. And that has to be our guiding light. Um, and so I'm just going to leave it there. And um, thank you so much. I encourage all of you to reach out to us, um, primarily on, on Instagram. Um, we have a wonderful team of people um, who are whose sole job it is to help and, and collaborate with uh, designers from across India. Thank you so much. Thank you, Henry. Could we have Tadbir Fatima? She is the director of Design Aware, and she's going to tell us a little bit about their work. Good morning. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about uh, the kind of work that we do. I'm an architect and educator, and our firm, Design Aware, is kind of a design experiment and um, it, it's an interdisciplinary design and architecture studio based in Hyderabad and Dubai. Uh, the theme of this year's World Design Assembly, Humanizing Design, really resonates with us as we believe that design is the collective effort of many minds and many hands. We especially value the skilled hands of those who craft, make, and build to take our designs from concept to reality. We first recognized the significance of community and context while working on a charity school for children from disadvantaged backgrounds in the his, uh, historical precinct of the Golconda Fort, which is situated between our natural and built heritage. Within the walls of the fort are low-rise, high-density settlements with steep, narrow lanes, colorful courtyard houses, and lots and lots of goats. The site was a very difficult terrain, covered in sheet rock. That's me over there. And it had a 20-foot drop in level from one end to the other. The layout of the site was dictated by the constraints, and the context became a dominant challenge throughout the project. This was a dark, uninspiring warehouse, which served as a makeshift school, which is not at all how a school should be, but unfortunately, this is how charity schools frequently are. What was really inspiring, though, was the outdoors, the traditional Indian system of learning under trees and the existing rock formations that the children were used to climbing. We aim to preserve open space, which is a commodity in the urban context, and to create spaces that were bright and fun by introducing pops of color throughout the building, but deliberately you know, leaving the walls raw to negate the kitschy neighborhood, but also, more importantly, to keep the building low maintenance for its future life. Perforated walls let in cool air and skylights over the two courtyard-like atriums, which bring in sunlight right into the heart of the building. And the red staircase connects all the levels like a spine. And the existing sheetrock that formed a cliff uh, on the site was preserved with indoor green spaces, and the building embraces the rock and merges into it. From this tight context, we carved out a school that has a very low impact on site and puts the focus on the students and the community instead. So these dark, dingy spaces were actually replaced by bright, open spaces, which are adapted by the students in their own ways. And sometimes the goats also attend class. In the greater context of Golconda, the school itself situates itself within the neighborhood as a magnet that impacts the community, sometimes serving as a vaccination clinic or a learning center, doing more than it was ever intended or designed to do. Flock is a project that is dictated by geometry, but its main aim is to involve community into the design process. Flock is a system of grooved interlocking puzzle pieces that take on a 3D form once assembled. Many minds and many hands work together to assemble this crowdsourced public art installation that is built by the people. So how to flock? Grab some pieces, grab some friends, get building, and flock together. The resultant form 
is not predetermined, but has multiple authors. Anyone can flock of different ages, backgrounds, and skill sets working together with a shared goal. Flock will be at IKEA today from 3 p.m., and we invite you all to take part. Beginning with a design-build workshop in Bamboo, we began to be concerned about the disappearance of natural building material in the world of depleting resources. We went into the desert of UAE to learn more about traditional building techniques and discovered that most vernacular houses used to be built by Bedouin craftswomen using arish or palm leaf uh, midribs. Today, this craft has been confined, unfortunately, to weaving baskets and mats, when in fact the material is very versatile and structural and prototypical. We decided to use Arish to build a complex geometric surface, a hyperbolic paraboloid, in order to cre create a dialogue between the vernacular and contemporary design. This installation is designed for Dubai Design Week and is called Vivex 1.1 Hypex and is located at Dubai Design District in stark contrast to the skyscrapers of Dubai. Further, uh, Wevex became truly sustainable when we used the palm leaves as modeling material for an accompanying workshop. Weaving and craft in natural materials is present throughout the world. In India, cane or rattan is a familiar material in furniture design, which we used to build the Wevex 1.2 in Hyderabad, which is located in Khairatabad Crossroads. Cane as a material uh, for geometric exploration gives surprising results, and we wanted to explore the bendability of this material and try to understand the level of control that we could establish over it. So we created Wevex 2.1 Helix based on the helicoid, and that's located at high tech. Some of you might have seen it. We learned that precise control of this material and its behavior is next to impossible and it must be relinquished at some point to let, it do, let the material do whatever it wishes. <clears throat> Another workshop in the same series was conducted with the aim to design and build. As we understand the negative impact of single-use plastics on the environment and with the phasing out of uh, disposable drinking straws the world over, this workshop gains more perspective and creates lasting installations instead that result from design research. You will be able to see some of these uh, in the exhibition next door. The Fractals Workshop is a generative design and 3D thinking workshop that is based on the teaching methods of the Design Research Lab at the AA School of Architecture, from which I'm an alumna. The workshop is derived from the growth patterns of natural systems, specifically fractals, in which students use analog algorithms in form finding. In this workshop, one design was selected and evaluating its fitness in terms of structure and performance, it was fabricated in large scale with the direct involvement of students and interface between students and fabricators. And the design was scaled three times. And this installation is now placed at Gun Park near Public Gardens, uh, opposite to the Telangana State Assembly. We call this collective intelligence a coming together of many minds and many hands to create awareness through livable, wearable, usable, accessible, and responsible design. Thank you. Thank you, Rukbir. I think what I find most fascinating from all the presentations that we've seen is that everyone's talking about working with people and working together in collaborations. Um, I think this entire conference is quite symbolic of that in itself. But having said that, and there's something that I'd like to come back to, just the idea of working with different agencies, working with individuals and different designers. But I think for me, the pressing question to begin with is we all know that necessity, or it's said that necessity is the mother of all inventions. But recently, I read an article where this gentleman had written that desperation is the father of brilliance. So if you'd like to come in, Sandeep. You think we are at a time where desperate, it's, we are in a, in a sense desperate to bring about change, to do something different. Are we recognizing that point in our time right now? I think in history, every phase has been a desperate phase to prove ourselves. I think uh, as we're talking about future, and it all depended on the past, and today is the past for the next future. So I guess uh, we as humans, uh, 
are always trying to push ourselves to the next. And, uh, but the time has come to balance things out rather than looking at one direction uh, to balance the past and the future together and then uh, have a very sustainable way of living and practice. Okay. So, Rakesh, you are working, the, the project that you're working on in IKEA, you have recognized this need for cleaner air, and you've also recognized the cause of that, and there's the solution. What's interesting is that you've identified the problem, you've found a solution, you're trying to, you're working with it. Um, you're also a big organization who is taking a small step. How do you feel you fare within the larger scheme of things? I feel that, yes, uh, it is extremely important to make the beginning, that is first step. And then, uh, yes, it has to be a collaborative approach wherein, you know, uh, we have to join hands, understand the problem, work towards more solution. One solution is not just enough for the problem that we are facing today. Uh, Yes, and uh, you know, we, we have found many more uh, solutions on which we are working on this direction. Uh, but in the waste material hierarchy, if I have to put those things, uh, you know, making something meaningful and adding waste uh, uh, into, uh, you know, converting it into a resource is the first thing that comes to our mind. I think it is good for everyone and, uh, uh, you know, the day we hand, join hands and then move together, it would be good for all of us. I'm curious to know why IKEA felt the need to do it in the first place. Yeah, very good question. Yeah, it is uh, why we felt because uh, one is that, uh, you know, Northern India where uh, this problem is very severe and according to uh, World Health Organization, uh, I mean, uh, top tw out of top 20 cities, I think nine of them fall under... Yes. Uh, uh, the northern belt of India, which is uh, severely polluted. And uh, IKEA is an organization where we feel that, uh, you know, uh, whatever we do, it has to be for the many people. It is for the betterment of that. And uh, it has to come from, uh, you know, uh, the designing or uh, what we call it as democratic designing. It is uh, basically aiming in a sustainable manner that we do everything. And, uh, you know, that should uh, help the communities, help everything. The problem it, uh, the, was more severe in that region. Uh, that is how we, it got triggered. We saw many people suffering, and uh, we wanted to contribute towards uh, this and take the first step. Uh, I would not call it that, yes, it is a first step from IKEA, but then there would be many uh, who have taken the steps in this direction. Uh, it is uh, just all of us uh, move together in uh, the same direction and create good conditions for us to live in. In fact, I think it's, it's highly inspiring and encouraging to see a big organization like IKEA do this. We often discount, you know, large organizations who are, who are into mass production. Um, and on the other hand, we've got individuals who are making their efforts, and it's rather discouraging because people feel, oh, if I take one step, how much of a difference am I going to make, right? Um, so it's, in, it's interesting to see larger organizations taking smaller steps towards this process. But coming back to Sandeep, and I'd like to question both of you as well on this, is that how much do you feel that what you are doing and the work that you're doing is important in building that future or, pay, or plays that key role in actually taking that step ahead? You're working with a lot of artisans. You've, you're you know, developing a lot of craft. You're working with old traditional techniques, but developing contemporary designs. So where do you think that falls into the future? Or how do you see that progressing ahead? Again, I, I like to look back into the past. For me, craftsmen were designers before designers came into existence. And they were solving these problems. And as time passed and digitalization happened, uh, they were used only for their skills rather than for their knowledge. I think uh, the time has come to tell them that knowledge is very important of what they carry and they need to carry it forward. Uh, and that was a challenge for me. Uh, to convince the younger generation that uh, what you're practicing is much more valuable. And as they say, grass is always greener on the other side. They see that, okay, if we leave this and go out, work in the industry, and it'll be a better life. But I guess uh, we are looking back to figure this out. So it's a very uh, kind of in a situation where we are looking at each other from each other's point of view. But how do we engage and uh, 
and let them make aware of the situation and what they carry as knowledge uh, which is not written but uh, translated from practice from generation to generation and how it can be kept alive. Yeah. So you're opening a dialogue. You're having that conversation and initiating the process. Yeah. 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 Henry, you're doing that a lot as well. You're collaborating with a lot of people at the Golden Age Design Labs and you're facilitating um, an entire sort of, you know, uh, for the lack of a better word, a movement, I would say, where you're actually encouraging people to step forward. You're working with them to, produ to produce products and produce material. So how do you see that fitting in? So, you know, I, th I think looking at the diversity of, of things that on this, people on this stage have worked on, I think it's important to realize that the problems that we face are so large, the, the, the scales, especially in India, are so large. Um, that there's no panacea that's magically going to fix it. It's going to be an all scales, kind of all directions thing. Um, and especially within the design ecosystem, there's so much room for growth that, um, that there's a space for everybody. And so I think now, especially with younger generations, because people are seeing that there aren't zero sum game, uh, games in all of this, that it leaves room and actually necessitates collaboration. Um, and you're starting to see that, and it's really, it's really heartening, right? Because we're moving away from a kind of a design world where people hide away their processes or they hide away their cargars or something like that in a very feudalistic way. Um, and so seeing that idea of collaboration and, and openness and honesty, um, I think is uh, a key part of changing that kind of core design awareness across society of what real, or of what design actually is. Yeah. Um, there's, there's this kind of connect between collaborating and technology as well, and you're using a lot of it too, Zagbir. Um, what's interesting to see is that you're collaborating with a lot of younger designers and students, so while, you know, Gotesh Design Lab, you're actually working with professionals, younger professionals to give them a space to, to kind of express themselves. You're working with students who haven't necessarily broken out of their eggshells, right? How is it working with them, and how do you see that? Because at the end of the day, they are the future, you know? I mean, we're all, we might be step one and two, mm -hmm. but are you, are you trying to kind of groom them young and give them that kind of space? Uh, I wouldn't call it grooming them, but then... <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so I think it's more about giving them a platform, yeah. which as a student, you know, I didn't have, or yeah. none of my classmates had. So what uh, we had, uh, you know, dreamed about, uh, if we are able to facilitate that for somebody else who's coming up in the, uh, in the profession in the next few years, that was the broader aim of this. The other thing is, I think I would say it's a little bit selfish as well, because if you have, uh, you know, if you have a team of people working for you, uh, when you have students, you have like a, a giant army working sure. for you. So you kind of uh, tap into their creative side and then use their ideas yeah. as well. Because um, our entire um, you know, focus is on open source design. So uh, like Henry said, uh, sharing of the design process. So we uh, make the design process very, very open and we allow people to learn our design process from the beginning till the end. So. Uh, when we do that, we involve students as well, and, and their design process also becomes uh, something that um, different people learn from one another, and it becomes a collaborative effort. And so the, uh, the idea or the notion of the single author uh, kind of becomes uh, diluted, and then you have multiple authors who are coming together and creating something together. So would you all agree that collaboration becomes like a key solution or one of the key solutions to what we want to do in the future and how we want to change it. Well, I, I think that's key because the object is almost insignificant at the end of the day in a lot of this, right? It's about making these, these systems and interconnected systems, whether it's through the designer working with people that are actually going to make it, the designer with people who are actually going to sell it, and the people that buy it, how are they actually going, actually going to use it, which the designer more often than not is wrong about. <laughs> but what about technology? Where does that kind of find its place in the process? For, for any of you, in fact. I think technology really fits in everywhere. Uh, like I work 
uh, based in Bangalore with communities in their places. It's not that they're coming to a factory and working, but that they're working for places. So technology helps us communicate, uh, transfer uh, images or uh, drawings and uh, prototypes across, uh, which connects. And I think technology can be used in many ways. Uh, uh, the way I use and look at it is uh, that we can communicate and connect uh, very quickly and fast and, and things move faster. So no one is isolated anymore. So it's interesting to see you're still using traditional methods, but you're, you're employing technology to kind of, you know, hasten the process. And is it easy? Do you, do you feel that people take to it easily? Or is there, is there resistance to that? Or do people take to it easily in your experience? They take it easily because it's uh, so widely spread out and people are using it. Everyone has a phone in their hands, so I think it's very convenient for them to use a new tool and they're proud of it. Uh, yeah. And you're using a lot of technology as well. Yeah, um, I think for us, it's about prototyping and uh, you know, uh, being able to generate a whole um, uh, sort of um, system of designs. You, know, you have a whole catalog of designs. Rather than having one, you can tweak uh, certain parameters, and that is what parametric design is all about. So, sure. so you have uh, many different um, you know, options that are coming up just by using technology rather than having to go through the entire process, process over and over again. again. So, yeah. so using computational tools, you're able to generate many different things and test those in the, in the digital space. What I also find interesting is, um, especially the work between what Rakesh you're doing and Sandeep, what you're doing, is that the, the use of the actual material, right? Um, again, Sandeep, you're using a lot of traditional material, conventional material, but bringing it up to a point where it's perceived very differently. And you're con completely changing the idea of what that may be, whether it was bamboo. Um, you talked about cane as well, which is, again, very traditional craft in India. Um, but on the other hand, IKEA is kind of developing new material from waste. So I don't know how many of us would have even considered rice straw or rice hay to turn that into an actual material where you're, you're developing products. So do you feel that there's this kind of, um, or how do you see that moving ahead in terms of you know, creating new materials versus using older materials to create new products? Do you face any challenges in that? Or do you, have you ever explored new materials? I think every material comes with its own challenge, and uh, that's the exciting part of it, working with natural materials. That every pole, every plank, and every leaf behaves differently. And how do you standardize something like that, uh, working with hands? So I guess uh, the challenges are exciting, and that keeps us going. And how to put the same material in a new context and change the perception. Uh, is not something I can perceive before I, uh, when I'm designing, but I guess uh, it's a process that evolves over a period of time, uh, which I cannot visualize, uh, but uh, I have a direction to find. And Rakesh, would you like to add something? I think uh, new materials are equally very, very important to uh, think about and start developing. Uh, just to quantify, I mean, uh, a small thing that, uh, you know, India is, agriculture in India is the biggest industry as such. And uh, the amount of just the rice straw that is being burnt, and these numbers are coming from the public yeah. domain, these are not made by me or I have not done any research on it. It is around 150 million tons of rice straw is available. It is huge quantity and, you know, we, we need to figure out what are the best usages out of it. Yes, we can uh, make a pulp and do paper out of it for packaging. We, we have an option to, uh, you know, make uh, rugs and all. We, we can uh, also go in for some uh, particle boards. Yes, uh, these are the natural materials and we need to uh, look into the sustainability part, uh, you know, which, uh, which can protect our uh, mother earth as well. That is the thought behind it. Any comments, I mean, I, thoughts? I mean, I think materials and technology and stuff like that, traditional crafts, traditional materials, those are fascinating new materials, you know, using um, cane in, in new ways that we're only able to understand how it's used by using computational tools. You know, it's, so it's, it's, again, technology is technology, whether it's a thousand years old or, or you know, 
a day old. Um, so I think it's about an idea of appropriateness and having designers really dig into the, the catalog of their toolbox, of their material shed at large, and, and search out for the most appropriate um, solution. Toby, would you like to add something? Yeah, I, I think it's really important to um, go back and learn the technologies that, that are being lost at the same time as we develop new ones. And definitely, um, you know, developing new materials or inventing new materials, uh, which are not just for the sake of invention, but as in response to a pressing issue. That makes a lot of sense. To actually address what's at hand. Yeah. So technology is telling us that the time's up, unfortunately, <laughs> and this could go on forever. But um, I think what's interesting is to see that when we talk about material futures, and to my, one of the first thoughts that came to my mind was whether we want to discuss what the future, um, what the materials are of the future, or whether the future is made up of these materials that you know we are going along and making. But it's interesting to see that collaboration definitely is key to what we have, what we hope to face ahead of us. And um, I, I would like to congratulate all of you for the wonderful work that you're doing, and hope to see a lot more of it and do hope to see a larger movement come through with this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.